Welcome everyone, this is Katie Wallace and we're talking tonight about merits of a ketogenic or fat-based diet. And I'm going to ask if you have questions during the presentation that you um, save them for the end. And there's a way to write them in the chat, which if you go to your settings screen, um, on my screen, if I hit on the breadcrumbs that look like more, then there's an option to hit chat. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to type them in there and, um, and I'll address that at the end. Also, I'd like to say that I'm not a medical doctor and the information I'm sharing is for health education purposes only and should not be taken for medical advice. So here we go. Always takes me a minute <laughs> to figure out. Here we go. <clears throat> okay. Um, so this talk tonight is co-sponsored by the Willie Street Co-op, which is a local food co-op in Madison, Wisconsin. And I give these uh, free lectures for them about once a month. So we'll be doing another lecture next month and also in March that'll be virtual. And one of the services that I offer through the co-op besides the lectures is uh, community sessions. So I do offer private sessions at a reduced rate for co-op members. So it's just $40 and there's just a few, a handful of sessions every month. Um, so you get a reduced fee for a private session with me and all those sessions are virtual. So if you're interested in that and you're a co-op member, then you can contact my office and I can help you with getting scheduled. Okay, tonight we're going to cover what is a ketogenic diet or a fat-based diet? How does this diet help with health? Uh, you know, what are the benefits? What, what do you actually eat when you're on a fat-based diet? And then some more technical things that you might wanna get to, into, like how do you actually measure the ketones that you're making? And then what are the trade-offs of this diet and things to keep in mind that if you choose to take this diet on, you'd wanna, um, you'd want to balance. So a ketogenic diet is a diet that uses fat instead of carbohydrates as the primary source of energy for all of your body's needs. So our body's cells, different cells are unique and um, they can, some of them can burn carbohydrates and fats and ketones. And some of them um, can only burn carbohydrates or ketones and some of them um, can burn different combinations. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, but because in this diet you're providing fat as a fuel, then uh, that provides the formation of ketone bodies. And that is what this diet is named for. Some of the very general benefits that people sing their praises to about this diet are that it's easier to burn fat um, and access your fat stores. So if you're someone who experiences weight loss resistance or you have trouble losing weight, then this can be a very good diet to consider. People also like that they have less hunger on this diet because especially the fat is more satiating. A true ketogenic diet does not have a lot of protein, but still it does, it does have adequate protein and protein as well as fat is one of the more satiating foods. People report having more energy on this diet compared to other diets they've been on, especially like steady energy um, so that they could have endurance um, with athletic things, but also just um, you know endurance to have steady energy throughout the day without having energy crashes. And then another very positive thing about the ketogenic diet is most people experience brain benefits. So the, a better sense of being alert, focused, better, better memory. So it achieves these great things basically because you're eliminating carbohydrates. Um, carbohydrates definitely have some benefits and we'll talk about that, but 
they tend to create more hunger because we can't really store carbohydrates as carbohydrates in our body. Um, we, so we have to burn them in a short period of time and then we wanna eat again. And um, when we eat carbohydrates, it causes our blood sugar to go up and our insulin levels to go up. And this can also create hunger cycles with these levels fluctuating up and down. And some of the foods listed here are just stimulants like the coffee and the chocolate, although chocolate does include carbohydrates. And the stimulants also kind of tend to promote this cycle of um, being hungry because they can affect the blood sugar levels too. So in functional medicine, which is one of the fields that I've done a lot of study and training in, and I think it has a lot of value to add in terms of how we approach health issues, one of the major tenets of functional medicine is that you've got to have good blood sugar control. And if you don't have blood sugar control, you're in trouble. And some people go so far as to say that every ailment in the body stems at some point from lack of blood sugar control. That's probably not true, but, but it is true in, in a lot of things. Um, so here's an example of physiologically <clears throat> some of the things that happen when we eat foods high in sugar. And by foods high in sugar, I mean just like a, a natural food, like a piece of fruit or a potato or a you know fancy uh, gluten-free cracker <laughs> or something like that. Something that's uh, providing a carbohydrate even if it's you know relatively healthy, or even if it's dessert, will raise your blood glucose or blood sugar level. And that in and of itself causes a cascade of things to happen. One of them is AGEs, which are called um, short for advanced glycation end products. And that's when the sugar in your bloodstream combines with proteins in your tissues to make like a caramelized um, mess. And there's a lot of medical literature about the impact of AGEs. And we believe that AGEs are behind a number of different disease processes and aging processes in the body. So that's one thing that makes us vulnerable that tends to happen when we eat foods high in sugar. And it tends to get, all of these things tend to get worse as we get older because our insulin sensitivity uh, declines as we get older. So like when we're young, we have a pretty good tolerance for carbohydrates, most of us. And then at some point, depending on a lot of different factors, that tends to taper off and we tend to have more of these problems. The other thing that happens when we eat foods that are carbohydrates that raise our blood sugar is that triglycerides increase. So triglycerides are made in the liver and they're the way that we store uh, carbohydrates or extra energy as fat. And too many triglycerides can cause obesity and fatty liver. Then our cholesterol increases and LDL increases, particularly the small particle LDL, which we understand can potentially put us at a greater risk for heart attack and stroke. Our HDL, which protects us from cardiovascular risk, decreases, so that's not a good thing. And then for men, when our blood sugar goes up, testosterone goes down, so that's not good for men. Testosterone will go down and their estrogen will go up. And for women, estrogen and progesterone shift. Typically we see estrogen dominate, which can lead to a number of different issues such as estrogen dominant cancer, and our progesterone decreases. So all of this comes from just eating some some carbohydrates. So what is a person to do? Well, that's why as we get older, it makes sense to look at increasing more fat in our diet, especially. And you can use ketogenic diets for children, but they're fairly restricted and I would only use them when they're necessary. So let's talk a little bit about the pros and cons of using carbs and fats as fuel. So the benefit to using carbohydrates is that every single cell in the body can use carbohydrates or what is called glucose, which is what carbs are converted to in the body. So that's a good thing. Um, and glucose also produces energy very quickly. So people that like to do high intensity exercise usually have a higher carbohydrate need than somebody who's doing more of an endurance 
exercise where they're not doing very short, intense bursts of exercise over prolonged periods. However, the drawback to those, um, those great things about glucose is that as an energy source inside our cells, it actually produces more free radicals. And what that means is that it increases oxidative damage or basically the aging process compared to fat or ketones. And furthermore, as we get older, our brain cells actually lose the ability to burn carbs as fuel. This is a really big problem that leads to a lot of cognitive illness. And there's a great book about this. I show you at the end of the talk, but I want to mention it now. It's called The End to Alzheimer's by uh, Dale Bredesen. And um, he's a doctor who has spent his whole career talking about uh, cognitive disease. And he's a big proponent of ketogenic diets uh, for this reason. Finally, too much glucose leads to metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is when you um, lose the ability to um, keep your blood sugar in balance and develop obesity and diabetes as a result. So we talked about carbs and the pros and cons. Let's talk about ketones. The good thing about ketones is that with our aging brains, ketones represent an alternative source of fuel for the brain that's actually dynamite and really, really good for the brain. And you can use ketones when you're young and you can use them when you're old and they're always a very good source of fuel for the brain. So if someone's having cognitive problems or experiencing cognitive decline, you know, this is, they can't use carbs anymore, but they can use ketones and not experience the deterioration of the brain. Uh, ketones, like I said, can be uh, a very efficient fuel. So they're more efficient than carbs and they're more efficient than fat. I'll explain the difference between the fat and the ketones shortly. And they're less inflammatory. So when you're using fat to make ketones um, and then your, your cells burn those ketones, there's less oxidative damage. There's less aging process. It, there's less aging. So in a way, a ketogenic diet can be um, anti-aging or it has this many anti-aging qualities. But the trade-off of the ketogenic diet is that you have to be really careful about what you eat. And especially in our culture, which is dominated by carbohydrates. Um, for some people, it may be more difficult to get into what's called ketosis when you're burning fat to make ketones. And you may need to get a little nerdy and do some testing in order to kind of fine tune how you approach your diet um, in order to get the results you want. Um, it may require a lot more attention to hydration for some people than they're used to. And we'll talk about that. Um, and uh, there's a lot of controversy about the ketogenic diet for thyroid issues. And I used to be kind of on the other side of the fence where I cautioned people with thyroid issues to use a ketogenic diet. And I, I don't do that anymore because I understand the diet much better and I follow it myself. Um, but if you have thyroid issues, you need to make sure you eat adequate calories on a ketogenic diet uh, in order to support the thyroid. So the ketogenic diet can help with a lot of different medical problems. These are, this is a list of all the different um, medical problems that we have research on, or we know that the ketogenic diet is uh, clinically very helpful for. So you see um, brain-based issues, epilepsy, cognitive decline, things related to blood sugar, like the diabetes, blood pressure, um, heart disease, as well as things related to hormones, right? Because when I showed you that slide, we saw that when our glucose is fluctuating, when our blood sugar is fluctuating, the end result is to affect our hormones. And so a ketogenic diet can kind of stop that um, imbalance and help with restoring hormonal balance for the body. Ketogenic diet can also be helpful with fatty liver disease because it's helping the body to burn fat stores uh, rather than make more triglycerides. 
um, which generally stem from a carbohydrate rich diet. It's also been studied in a number of cases of cancer. And I actually have a whole nother program about using the ketogenic diet for cancer. Um, and, and so it's a, a very interesting topic, but basically we know that fasting is very uh, beneficial with cancer. Um, it helps the cells to be more efficient and it helps to boost the immune system. And so a ketogenic diet is kind of a way to get the benefits of fasting without fasting. So that's in a nutshell how it can be very therapeutic. Um, and it also helps with migraines, both because of the benefit for the brain, but also because it helps reduce inflammation and bring about blood sugar control, all of things that tend to contribute to migraines. So the greatest benefit of the keto diet are the ketones that a person makes. So the ketones are BHB, acetoacetate, and acetone. And basically when the liver begins to burn fat for energy and is burning fat, it makes these um, ketones kind of as a byproduct of burning the fat. And then the ketones are available to be circulated throughout the body. So we know that the brain, the heart, the kidney, the skeletal muscles love ketones. Uh, there may even be other tissues that like ketones that haven't been studied yet, but these are the ones that we know um, really seem to thrive on ketones as a source of energy. And like I said, in the brain, the ketones are fabulous. They're, the brain loves ketones and puts them to work. And it seems to help with a lot of dysfunction that can show up in the brain. In fact, ketones can actually be converted into long chain fatty acids that play an important role in repairing our brain and protecting it from damage. So a keto diet, generally speaking, is high fat, moderate protein, and low or very low carbohydrate, really, um, if you're going to compare it to low carbohydrate diets. So a common example would be the orange here would be the amount of calories coming from fat. And then um, the healthy proteins would be, yeah, you know, 15, 25%, and about the same for the green vegetables, about 50%, 15% is what's shown here. So this is what it looks like in terms of calories, but this isn't what a, this isn't what a plate looks like when you sit down, right? The plate's not going to be covered in fat because um, fatty things are calorie dense. So just a couple tablespoons of a uh, fat rich food is usually adequate for a meal. I'll show you what a plate of food looks like soon. But before I do that, uh, let's just talk about some other popular diets and how they compare to the ketogenic diet. Cause I think there's a lot of confusion sometimes when people are talking about this or that diet. So the Mediterranean diet, very popular diet has 25 to 35% protein, 50 to 60% carbohydrates. So it's relatively high in carbohydrates. It's the highest of all of these diets we're comparing, 25% fat. So this, this is pretty close to maybe what a lot of healthy standard Americans strive for, right? They might have a little bit of salad dressing and then their whole grain or their potato, and then you know um, maybe a modest portion of protein. Compare that to a low carb diet, which has 40% protein, 20 to 30% of calories coming from carbohydrate and 20 to 30% from fat. So you'll see the ketogenic diet is very different than a standard low carb diet. And the traditional Atkins diet, again, about 40% protein, 10% carbohydrate. So it's very restricted, very low carbohydrate, the typical Atkins and 50% of calories from fat. So to compare to that, a ketogenic diet really is a high fat, very low carbohydrate diet. We've got protein at 15 to 25%. So we don't want too much protein. The reason for this is we don't want an Atkins diet if we're trying to be ketogenic because protein can be broken down into carbohydrates and burn for energy. And so you won't make ketones if you eat too much protein. So that's why protein is um, kind of a piece to pay attention to and make sure you're dialed in on. 
Carbohydrates range from 5 to 15% of the calories, and then fat is a whopping 70%. So you can see it's really much higher in fat than any of these other um, typical diets that people talk about. So more on that, but I want to talk for a few minutes about how the ketogenic diet is so good for the brain. And so the ketogenic diet is really famous for helping with epilepsy. And it appears that the ketones stop the brain from having seizures. And uh, one study that was published in Science Daily showed that they think the ketogenic diet actually alters the genetic expression of the brain cells. And that's what stops them from having the seizures. We know that the ketones act as an antioxidant and so they protect the brain. And that, um, as I mentioned, the brain cells lose the ability to metabolize carbohydrates, and so ketones represent um, a beneficial fuel for that. Ketones also increase the mitochondrial efficiency. So um, mitochondria are little organelles inside of our cells, and they're kind of like the project manager inside all the cells, uh, you know, and all your cells are different in your different tissues. But in the brain, the ketones seem to really help protect and make the mitochondria more efficient, which means they're less likely to become um, sick. Also, ketones seem to trigger the expression of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is something that's, um, that we make in our brain, which helps improve learning and higher thinking and memory. And there have been some studies, limited studies, on the role of a ketogenic diet with brain cancer. And I bring this up because brain cancer is um, one of those diseases that is um, very difficult to manage medically. I mean, for anybody, it's there aren't many good treatment um, treatments available or, you know, very good treatment outcomes. And um, so the ketogenic diet is actually showing a lot of promise when it's coupled with conventional medical treatments. Uh, it seems that it's slowing down the growth of the cancerous cells in the brains. And the reason for this is that cancer cells in brain cancer and in many other types of cancer, but not all cancer cells, but but many of them, we're still trying to study the different, well, researchers are still trying to study the different cancer cells. And um, many of them seem to rely solely on carbohydrates. So when you take the carbohydrate away, they can't survive. And the healthy cells can burn the ketones made from fat, but the tumors can't. So the tumors stop growing and get smaller on a ketogenic diet. Ketogenic diet has also been extensively studied with diabetes. So it helps with glucose or blood sugar levels, lowering those, lowering the triglyceride production, right? Because that's stored fat that's made in the liver um, from eating too many carbohydrates and having high blood sugar. It helps with lowering insulin levels. And this is very important because insulin is extremely inflammatory to the body. So when we, as we're aging, we make more insulin because we get more insulin resistant. So we're making more and more insulin for every time we eat carbohydrates. Um, then that insulin is triggering uh, a number of problems downstream, but it's triggering more cytokines that are chemicals in our immune system that trigger inflammation. Um, and it's also triggering more estrogen, both for men and women, which tends to, again, um, disrupt the balance of hormones and create a lot of problems. And obviously, um, in our culture, uh, we have an issue with obesity and the ketogenic diet helps people who are weight loss resistant. So the ketogenic diet appears to make us more insulin sensitive. So this is a good thing because this is reversing insulin resistance. And it appears to decrease our fasting insulin levels, even when the keto diet is compared to moderate or low fat diets. 
So, so when we go head to head with these different diets, the keto diet outperforms. Here's an example, if you bear with me. This study, which was done for 24 weeks with diabetic participants showed that they took one group of participants and they put them on uh, their normal diet, but they restricted them 500 calories. So a 500 calorie deficit, let's see how your blood sugar and your weight loss improve. And then they compared that to a ketogenic diet where they restricted the number of carbohydrates, but otherwise said, you can eat as many calories as you want. And even telling them they could eat as many calories as they wanted, the keto diet outshined the diabetic, um, I'm sorry, the, the typical low calorie, like let's just cut 500 calories approach. So we saw a greater reduction in hemoglobin A1C, which is a marker for your three month average of blood sugar. We saw a greater reduction in the fasting blood sugar, saw a greater reduction in BMI and a greater reduction in weight loss. Um, and even when you look at the studies that look at the studies, that's what a meta-analysis is. They basically found that very low carbohydrate diets like keto diets are really beneficial for people with diabetes um, and that they outshine the other diets. I think I might've skipped this slide, sorry. Um, this was just a study, Yancey et al., 2010, where they compared a keto diet to the traditional approach to diabetes, which is putting people on prescription drugs and putting them on a low-fat diet. And the keto diet um, outperformed that traditional approach to diabetic management as well. So very exciting um, results, you know, because if you can avoid using some of the medical intervention or the drug interventions, then that um, that, that's a great savings, um, in a lot of areas. The ketogenic diet can also help a lot of hormonal problems. Like I mentioned, if we eliminate the blood sugar issues and the way that they throw hormone balance off, then, um, it can really be very helpful. So I've seen the keto diet work really well for eliminating moodiness in menopause and perimenopause hot flashes, um, so uh, lots of benefits there. And there's also good news that ketones provide a lot of athletic benefits. And we know that the skeletal muscles uh, love ketones and the studies that have been done show that you get increased endurance, especially with um, cyclists on ketogenic diet, a decrease of muscle breakdown, decrease in blood lactic acid levels, reduction in oxida oxidation and inflammation. Well, that makes sense because we know at a cellular level that the ketones are just more efficient, right? So if you're burning a lot of energy as an athlete, then um, you know your net oxidation is gonna be reduced if you're using ketones and then reduced fatigue because you're not experiencing the blood sugar roller coaster that comes along with eating a high carbohydrate diet. There are uh, exogenous ketones. This is a fancy word for ketones in a supplement form. And so some um, athletes find these especially helpful for um, providing extra energy and endurance, uh, but you don't have to be an athlete you know, even people that aren't on a ketogenic diet can use these powdered supplements that are basically providing high quality ketones. Uh, so you can use them with kids who have, or in adults who have attention deficit disorders or are somewhere along the spectrum and need more support for the brain. Um, they're very safe to take for people of all ages, not, not really any contraindications with taking these supplements. Um, I recommend the Go BHB, which you might be able to see here on the right-hand bottle. Um, that, that's a very good uh, form of ketones that is sold to these different manufacturers. If you go to the health food store and you're looking for ketone supplements, you're going to really want to read the fine print because uh, when I go in and I look at those, I don't find any ketones on the label at all or I find very cheap ketones. So it might say it's ketones, but it might just be a high fat uh, supplement or food. 
Um, so there is a big difference between eating the fat and actually getting the ketones. So you're going to want to look for one of these supplements. And I carry these um, and can help you if you need it. So let's talk about um, the, the carb thing. <laughs> this is probably one of the harder things um, to consider. Not, not that it's that hard, but it does require attention. I really love that the ketogenic diet helps people with blood sugar problems, not just diabetics, but like people that get hangry or people that have worse symptoms when their blood sugar is fluctuating up and down. And uh, blood sugar, when it's high, will give people cravings or make them very sleepy or give them brain fog after the meal. Um, or make them just feel like they need to eat again right away. So if you're one of those people who's kind of has the munchies at night, that's usually the blood sugar swinging high. And if your blood sugar swinging low, you usually know it because you're hangry or you're nauseous or, you know, you have a lot of symptoms when you haven't eaten, um, when you've gone too long without eating. So um, I'm saying all of this as a preface to say that it's very important to get this 20 gram threshold right if you wanna do a ketogenic diet and get the benefits because it's kind of black and white for the body. And in 20 grams, I will say, is just like a reference mark for the general person. Sure, some people can probably eat a little more net carbs and some people can probably eat a little less, but generally speaking, your average adult who's doing a ketogenic diet is gonna to need to aim for about 20 grams of net carbs or less daily. If you don't do that, if you eat more than that, like let's say instead of a very low carbohydrate diet, you say, well, I'm, I'm gonna be keto for dinner, but I'm still gonna eat my wrap at lunch or whatever. You won't get the benefits of being ketogenic because your body won't actually burn fat until you're below this threshold. So it's like the body loves carbs and it's going to burn carbs if you provide them. So you really do have to get the carbohydrate low enough for the body physiologically to flip into ketosis. And that's where you get all these benefits. Um, if you don't want to do that, then you should probably think about supplementing ketones because you're never going to get into ketosis if you um, eat too many net carbs. So this is kind of the sticky point about the diet is, you know, you have to, and you don't even have to, to necessarily measure. I don't know that I've ever tallied up my net carbs in a day, honestly. And I've been on a ketogenic diet for about um, two and a half years. <laughs> And I know that I'm in ketosis because I measure the ketones. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So you don't necessarily have to do this, but if, if you find that you're, you're on this keto diet and it just doesn't seem like it's working, that's where dialing this in and, and making sure you're really limiting your carbs will be really helpful. So net carbs, I just wanna explain are what we're really worried about. And a net carb is the total carbohydrate in the food minus the fiber. So a food that's very high in fiber is going to be very low net carb. So you can eat more of a high fiber food than you can of a high sugar food on a keto diet. For example, the apple's the first thing, it's got 21 total carbs, 3.7 grams fiber, so net carbs is 17. I'm not gonna eat an apple probably very often <laughs> on my keto diet because I'm gonna get net carbs from all the vegetables and even a little bit of the protein I'm eating all day long. It's not hard to get to 20 grams and I know an apple's gonna push me out of ketosis. However, I could eat an avocado. If we go down five lines, you can see, well, it's pretty high in fiber. It's only going to net me about five net carbs. So yeah, I mean, you could actually eat um, more than one avocado if you really wanted to, or blackberries, right? 2.7 net carbs versus 17 or, um, you know, 21 from the dried apricot. So, so this is what we're talking about. We're talking about net carbs, and it can be helpful to people to look at this when they're figuring it out. But like I said, honestly, when I started a keto diet, 
I ate eggs and meat and lots of vegetables. And I made soup out of vegetables and um, chicken stock and beef stock. And I put olive oil in it and lots of salt and good seasonings. And I, I didn't measure anything. <laughs> um, I just didn't eat, I didn't eat fruit um, and I didn't eat starchy things anymore. Um, so you, I'm just saying this because I don't really like counting this stuff. I think it's kind of a waste of time and energy to obsess too much over numbers, but there's the science. Um, and there, there is a rhyme and a reason for those numbers. So it's there if you need that. Some people are hesitant to follow a keto diet because, oh my God, it's a high fat diet. And isn't fat like evil? <laughs> I mean, that's, I was raised in the eighties. Um, and uh, I think unfortunately that legacy of uh, low fat diet is still in our consciousness today. But we do have some good studies coming out uh, to help us to see for sure, you know, it can a high fat diet actually be good for the heart? Um, because it, it turns out, and this is a whole nother talk, but um, it's mainly carbohydrates that um, can contribute, excessive carbohydrates contribute to heart disease more so than um, good fats do. Um, but anyway, the studies show that um, a ketogenic diet will help increase beneficial HDL more than your standard low-fat, high-carb diet. And it'll also help decrease LDL particle number. So LDL is a type of cholesterol that can tend to aggravate um, the cardiovascular tissues and cause more placking. And so the ketogenic diets actually help us a lot because they help make the LDL healthy and large in particle size um, and, and reduce the risk for heart disease. So what does one eat exactly on a keto diet? You wanna eat fats, you wanna eat proteins, but careful, don't eat too much, about 15% of your calories to come from protein. And there's some good uh, protein calculators. If you just like Google keto diet protein calculator, there's one on the website ruled me, R-U-L-E-D um, M-E dot com. Um, so, so you can calculate about how much protein you need. Um, and then you do need carbohydrates and getting those from above ground vegetables is best because the below ground vegetables tend to be higher carbohydrate. So fats, we're talking about nuts like macadamia nuts and pecans are high fat. Some of the other nuts aren't very high fat. So you gotta be careful. Um, you know, if you're eating a lot of nuts to, to look into it and, and focus on the higher fat ones. Uh, coconuts, an example of a great food, eggs, olives. I mean, there's lots of foods out there, but 70% of calories from fat breaks down to about eight to 10 tablespoons a day for men and six to eight tablespoons for women. So I don't know about you, but I talk to people about what they eat a lot. And it's pretty typical for someone to say, well, I put like some olive oil on my salad and, you know, maybe they had something a little fatty at another meal, but that's it. So six to eight tablespoons for a woman is a lot more fat. So it's kind of a big adjustment. These are some of the fats that I use. Um, this jar on the left is bacon grease. So we frequently have bacon for breakfast in our household and I'll save the bacon grease and then I'll use it for um, sauteing vegetables or heating things up. Um, olive oil is in this tall bottle. Uh, olive oil is great. You can just add it to soup. You can add it to salads. You can put it on roasted vegetables. The green jar is pesto. And this is kind of my tried and true fat because I love pesto. And it's a lot more flavorful and interesting to me than a lot of the other typical fats. So I make a big jar every week. Uh, rotate between basil, 
uh, parsley, cilantro, I've made ramp. <laughs> I mean, really anything you can make pesto out of with just the, the green vegetable or herb, the olive oil, some kind of nut or seed, garlic and salt. So I don't use Parmesan. Mayo here is on the right. If you're a mayo lover, then that's going to be so easy for you on the ketogenic diet because you can pretty much add mayonnaise to any meal, right? You can use mayo as a salad dressing. You can use it to make um, chicken or fish or meat or egg salad. Um, I like also to use ghee. Um, I probably use ghee, which is clarified butter, more than the butter. Uh, I find that that agrees with me more because I'm I am a little bit sensitive to too much dairy. Um, avocado is always good. You can kind of rotate that in. Um, you make different sauces with the avocado, or make guacamole, and then an egg. Um, so one of the foods very high in fat for protein. I'm a big fan of fish and seafood. I think if there were one food I had to be stuck on a desert island with, uh, I could only eat one thing and try to get the health benefits of it, it would be fish or seafood because there's just no other food that provides the benefits. Um, so, so, so many good benefits. Um, also grass-fed beef and other pastured grass-fed animals are a great source of protein and other nutrients. When they are eating grass, they're high in omega-3s. That's the food that they were designed to eat or adapted to eat. When they eat grain or even soy, a lot of these animals are fed um, grain and soy, then the food is very inflammatory um, because the, the, it's not really a natural food for that animal to be eating, I, I guess. And um, it promotes the development of a lot of omega-6s. So when we get too many omega-6s in our diet, we have a lot of inflammation. So these foods can actually be anti-inflammatory when the animal is eating its natural food and living like a natural animal outside. The vegetables that we can eat on a keto diet are typically green, but actually there's some colorful vegetables you can eat too, but um, really many, many vegetables, but here's just an example of um, some of these above ground vegetables that are great to eat. So here's an example breakfast, although um, I, I would probably have pesto on top of this egg and maybe a piece of um, toasted seaweed on the side. That's one of my favorite breakfasts, but just got, you know, a breakfast sausage here made from pastured, um, pastured pork and then um, eggs. An example lunch would be um, leftover vegetables maybe, or, or warmed up vegetables, or even a salad would be fine. So this is just cabbage um, and, uh, or, you know, broccoli. I mean, really anything you wanna put there. And then uh, sardines, right? Trying to get that seafood in. But if you're not a fan of fish, you know, this could really be any kind of protein you like. And then the example dinner, you see my pesto made an appearance finally in this day um, with, with some more fish. I don't always eat fish twice a day. You could certainly eat beef and lamb and um, pork and different poultry. And um, then the salad has things like kohlrabi and beauty heart radishes and carrots. So you don't wanna eat a lot of root vegetables like that, but certainly a few of them in a salad um, is a good way to go with the ketogenic diet. So you can see the plate's really covered by vegetables mostly, um, a little with, with some protein. And then, you know, I've got, I've got at least a couple tablespoons there of the pesto for the fats. And then I've got salad dressing on the uh, salad. So I hope that gave you a sense of um, what to eat on a ketogenic diet. I am a big fan of eating soup, especially if you're starting a ketogenic diet. Um, soup or chili um, can also be very satisfying and kind of a very easy food to help make a diet change happen because you can just make a big batch and heat it up. And um, so that recipe is actually on my website, what I recommend for people. I have a few articles on my website. So if you go to the news button, and look for the ketogenic 
articles. There's three different articles and they cross-reference each other and it, they share a lot of the information I'm talking with you about tonight, including uh, that soup recipe that I like. So if you wanna measure ketones, then you'll know if the diet is really working because um, you can buy these inexpensive strips like on Amazon for $10 and they will have a ketone component. Um, in this, if you can see it, ketone is the third from the bottom. So there's a pink row here and it goes from pink to purple. So the strips are kind of cool. If you wanna see if your ketogenic diet is actually working, you would um, take this, usually in the morning is good, but really it's fine to check throughout the day. Um, and most people are going to see higher levels in the morning because they've been fasting for longer since dinner. But you really, ideally, most people are looking for just a trace amount of ketones. So you don't want it to be negative, but you don't want it to be like purple, like extreme level of ketones. Because if you've got extreme level of ketones, then you're starving and that's not good. So you don't want so many ketones that your body is, is just like not getting enough fuel and is burning so much fat. Um, uh, there are some cases where people want higher levels like in cancer cases, but generally for the average person, you're just looking for like middle of the road level of ketones and that's awesome if you're there. You don't wanna to be too high and you don't wanna be negative. You can also upgrade and spend more money and get one of these meters, which um, requires a pinprick of your finger. And then it'll tell you uh, how many ketones you're making. So that can be a little, little more accurate. Um, so it's, it's fine, but in truth, most people do just fine with the urine test strips and there isn't a need unless you're just really into this kind of stuff to prick your finger and check your level. So don't be confused by ketoacidosis. So I've been practicing in the nutrition field for about 15 years now. And so over the course of that time, uh, you know, ketogenic diet has really changed. When I first uh, started studying nutrition, my ketogenic diet was like, oh, that's like a bad thing. And it's going to create ketoacidosis, which is bad. So ketoacidosis is something that um, happens in type 1 diabetics when their blood sugar is completely uncontrolled. They're very, very ill. Um, so it's a very bad thing, but fortunately it does not apply to anyone else with a typical uh, keto diet. So don't worry about ketoacidosis. Um, it only applies to very severe type 1 diabetics. Um, type 1 diabetics can uh, use a keto diet therapeutically to help with a lot of their blood sugar issues, but it should be done with the direction of a health practitioner. So I mentioned that you're going to have to focus on hydration when you do a keto diet, and that is because when you start making ketones, they have a diuretic effect, which means you're going to be peeing more, urinating more. And when you urinate, you lose some of your electrolytes. So you lose potassium, sodium, magnesium, calcium, more than you normally would on a different diet. So, um, so it's good to focus on hydration, you know, making sure you're drinking enough water to begin with, but also that there are electrolytes in what you're eating and drinking. So I like to use uh, these here. I use baking soda, which is sodium bicarbonate to add more sodium back into my system. And I like also to buy bulk potassium bicarbonate. And I just buy that on Amazon. I you know, research it and buy a good organic brand, um, but it's a lot cheaper than potassium pills and preferable to me. Um, but uh, you could use potassium pills too. Um, but I just like these because they're affordable and uh, you can just dissolve them in water and drink them. Some people make a lemonade. Uh, so they just squeeze lemons and limes to get more electrolytes in their water. You can also 
get electrolytes with bone broth. So some people recommend lots of broth when you start the ketogenic diet. I recommend a lot of salt, uh, sea salt. And my favorite is the Baja gold salt. Um, so the salt can be put in your water or in, um, in your food, or you could just eat more salty things like pickles and olives and salty things you like. Your body will tell you when you need these things. I mean, it's, these are all healthful things to do anyway, so there isn't really a problem with increasing these things, but it's not uncommon when people start the ketogenic diet to have kind of an adjustment phase. And one of the adjustments could be uh, cramps, like leg cramps at night can be very common. And that's a sure sign that you're not getting enough electrolytes and you need to do some of these things I'm talking about. Um, if you had another concern about mineral loss, like maybe you're concerned about your bone health, then and you want to do a ketogenic diet. There's lots of good reasons to do the ketogenic diet, but you need to be aware that you're going to have to increase your minerals, increase magnesium, increase sodium um, to, to compensate. One of the other things that can happen on a keto diet, especially if you've never done um, any kind of food-based cleansing or a big overhaul of your diet in the past, is that when you go from making insulin to a fat-based diet where you're not really making a lot of insulin to handle the blood sugar, there's a hormonal shift that happens in the body. And some people call this the keto flu. So you might feel kind of headachey or tired or just kind of off. And the good news is that usually this adjustment phase just lasts a couple days. And the best way to get through it is to make sure that you're hydrating and providing enough electrolytes and that you're eating enough food to help your body you know, recover from, oh my gosh, you're not feeding me dessert and you're not eat, feeding me a sandwich and <laughs> you're not feeding me whatever. Um, so you might not experience uh, um, this adjustment phase, but, but you may, so that's why I like to mention it. A couple other things to think about, and this is really goes for changing your diet overall, uh, any kind of dietary upgrade, you wanna think about digestive secretions. So number one, digestive secretion is stomach acid because digestion is north-south, right? So if you got good stomach acid production in your stomach, then it's going to help trigger all the beneficial secretions all the way down the line to the gut. So some people um, who don't like to eat meat, sometimes that's a, a flag that um, they might have stomach acid issues or might not make a lot of stomach acid if they feel like when they eat animal protein, it's just like a brick in their stomach. So some of the things that can help with that are salt, like sea salt and apple cider vinegar. Both these things are very gentle and can be taken with meals. Or you can go with something even stronger like betaine and pepsin, which really helps trigger um, stomach acid production. So that can be helpful if when you're eating uh, quality protein, you're, you're having problems with digestion. And then obviously fat. Some people don't digest fat very well. And even though the ketogenic diet sounds great for them, they might try it and they might feel horrible because they can't digest fat. <laughs> so sometimes the body needs a little bit of help. And the way that the body digests fat is with bioflow from the liver gallbladder. So there's a couple of supplements I'm particularly fond of, the Beta Plus or the Beta TCP by Biotics Research are really good. Uh, but just generally speaking, bitter herbs like dandelion help trigger bioflow. So if you're eating high fat foods and you don't feel good, you need help digesting fat. Um, it's not going to be okay to be on a high fat diet if you're not handling uh, fatty foods very well. So this is really, really important. So I think... That's about it. Here's some of the books um, that I would suggest you check out if you want. The End of Alzheimer's is there. That's the Dale Bredesen book that I mentioned. He's the doctor who talks about preventing cognitive decline. It's a fantastic book. 
Um, if you're interested in the ketogenic diets for epilepsy, then the one on the left, ketogenic diets, fifth edition is a popular one. Um, Dr. Colbert's Keto Zone Diet can be a helpful book to read if you're kind of new to the keto diet and you want to review this information and read more. And then Radical Metabolism by Gittleman um, is another great book about the keto diet and kind of the ins and outs. Well, and there's one more book um, that I've read since I made this slide called Keto for Women that I really like. So I'd recommend that one too. So to summarize, a ketogenic diet is a fat-based fat diet, many benefits for many different health conditions. Basically, it's called a ketogenic diet because your liver is breaking down fats, um, and then those ketones go to provide uh, fuel for many of the body's tissues. You want to make sure you keep your net carbs low enough because keto ketosis is really black or white. So if you're only kind of ketogenic, it's not going to work. <laughs> you're not going to make ketones and the problems that you're having on a regular diet are not going to go away. So that's kind of the big deal with the ketogenic diet is dialing in that carbohydrate level that's right for you, right? All of us are different. Um, so you, sometimes you got to experiment and troubleshoot. But basically, you're eating low-carb vegetables, healthy fats, and moderate proteins. And then consider monitoring your progress and make adjustments where necessary. I'm here to help. Uh, this is one of my favorite topics. I, um, I wish I had found the ketogenic diet earlier in life. Um, and hadn't been resisted, you know, I knew about it as a practitioner and somebody who reads a lot in this field. I knew about it for a while, but it took me, um, you know, it took me several years to kind of come around and actually try it for myself. And um, I, um, I have been someone, I think, who has never really digested fat very well. And now I have the support I need to digest fat. And it's, um, so a ketogenic diet has been really great for me because I feel like my body, and I don't think I'm alone in this, has needed fat and fat soluble vitamins for my whole lifetime. Um, and so to finally have a fat based diet, I just feel so many benefits. So anyway, I'm here for you. And um, I hope you'll join me next month to talk about um, smooth moves. So we'll talk about constipation and some gentle ways uh, to address constipation without laxatives. And then in March, I'm going to talk about overcoming a sensitive stomach. So if you have heartburn or GERD or have a loved one who suffers from this, I'm going to talk about natural ways to help overcome a sensitive stomach. So thank you, everyone. Um, so glad you joined me and Hopefully I'll see you at one of the future webinars.